And here we are. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the July episode of The Roadshow here on Bookish Road Trip. I am Lee Bukowski. I'm your host. And I'm delighted to bring you our panel today where we talk about our theme, Follow Your Heart or Follow the Rules. So before we get started, anybody out there who is watching live, let's see, we'll give people a chance to um, to sign on. Actually, let me uh, introduce the panel first, and then I'll give my little uh, my little programming note. Um, so let's begin with introducing my fabulous panel. So we have Barbara Conry. She's the USA Today bestselling author of Nowhere Near Goodbye, her debut, and also My Secret to Keep, both published by Red Adept Publishing. Barbara is an active member of the Women's Fiction Writers Association, the Women's National Book Association, Author Talk Network, and she also moderates our online book club here at Bookish Road Trip. She does a fabulous job at that. And full disclosure, Barbara is a dear friend of mine. I'm so happy to see you here today, Barbara. Thank you so much. And you also are a dear friend of mine. <laughs> Thank you. So we also have Anna Quinn. Anna is the author of The Night Child, which was published in 2018, listed as number one psychological fiction on Goodreads. And Angeline, which I just read and is fabulous, uh, which just came out this year, which was nominated for National Book Award. Her writing has appeared in Psychology Today, Writer's Digest, and more. She's the founder of the Writer's Workshop in Port Townsend, Washington, where she lives with her charming husband and delightful dog. <laughs> Some days it might be the delightful uh, husband and charming dog. I, maybe, that's a, maybe that's a sliding scale. Depends on the day, yeah. Depends on the day. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. And we also have with us Allison Ragsdale. She is the author of nine best-selling and award-winning novels and a short story collection. Uh, she writes, her books take place in the islands and highlands of Scotland. I love that. Uh, described as heart-wrenching tales about family life and overcoming adversity, which of course will fit in very well with our theme for today. Uh, Allison's a former marketing, marketing executive, originally from Edinburgh, now lives near Washington, D.C. with her husband and two beloved dogs. And I just finished uh, Allison's book, The Child Between Us, which is fabulous and I highly recommend. Uh, welcome, Allison. So nice to meet you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, um, I do want to tell you if you are uh, viewing us live, you definitely want to make sure that you, you can make comments and you can ask questions, but you want to allow StreamYard uh, permission to access your Facebook name. If you don't do that, you will only show up to us as Facebook user, and then we won't know who you are, and we'd like to know who you are. So that's just a that's just a programming note. Okay, so let's get to this idea of follow your heart or follow the rules. So um, we were talking about some things before we went live, but I want to start, I, I'm wondering myself, um, so before you start writing your books, do you, uh, is this type of conflict intentional? In other words, do you know that this is going to be a central theme or you know do you it does it just kind of unfold in the writing process barbara what do you say to that well all my books i say all and i only have two published but the third one is third coming on the way yeah the third one's on the way um all my books are about the hard subjects it's like those are the kind of books i like to read mm -hmm. so those are the kind of books I like to write. So it is very intentional with me. And the funny thing about that is, I always thought, and I, I'm assuming that everyone knows this author, I always thought when I was dreaming about being a writer that I was gonna be the new Irma Bombeck. I was gonna write funny, but yet relevant. I, I, and that's what I thought, and that's not what comes out. It's like, no matter how, what kind of story I come up with, I will find the darkness in it. And that's what I write. Yeah, I that's, no, that's interesting. And I, and I think it's very interesting that you say you let you write what you read. And yes, and that makes absolutely. a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could, I honestly, though, could see you as a, a, a new Irma Bombeck, but <laughs> we'll see. We're, we're just getting started. You're just getting started. And <laughs> yeah. how about you? Do you, is that, is that kind of, that hard writing about the hard things um, is it intentional at the outset or, you know, do you kind of come up with things as you, as you go along? Yeah. Well, the, the, um, the theme for Angeline with that, the theme of the follow your gut really in your heart 
um, or break the rules. I didn't know it until really I was quite a way into the first draft. I rarely know my themes until I start writing because um, my stories tend to come to me in my dreams. Mm -hmm. And so when Angeline first appeared in a dream and continued to reappear and reappear and become more vivid, then I start to, um, when I get up in the morning, I sketch the images in my sketchbook and I start mind mapping what all the possible themes could be. So when she originally, I saw her lying on the floor in this prostrate position, then I start to feel like, oh, the, this could possibly be a theme of submission or when she's facing this sheriff and the faces are very intense, I think, mm hmm, you know, what is this going to be about? Is this going to be questioning authority, misogyny? It could be anything. And mm -hmm. so I just, I just keep looking at the pictures and considering what they might be and what is this about and what does she want and where will I go with her? And I just really just try to serve the character and see, see what it's about. Yeah. You know, I read somewhere and so many quotes by authors, but I exactly what you just said that when you write fiction, you figure out what your first, what your character wants or doesn't have, and then let him or her take you there, follow him or her. Uh, so it's kind of, that's interesting to, that you say it kind of unfolds and you, you know, yeah. comes in a dream and, um, your your cover captures that that whole idea very very well. Your cover is very striking, very thank beautiful. You. Yeah, um, thank you. I think it's it's part of the joy and the conundrum of writing is the not knowing and to mm -hmm. and to see where it leads you and the discovery of it. For me, anyway, yes. that, that I, that's the part I most love. Yes, and it can it can be a blessing or or a curse depending you know that's how it's going. <laughs> there are a lot of days when you're just what does this <laughs> mean? Oh, I hope it doesn't mean that. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And the days where it's like I should be doing anything but this, <laughs> when it's too hard. Allison, so your your books are described as emotionally charged, uh, as as you know, the, the hard things, the people overcoming adversity. So, do you when you're going into your writing? Do you know that, that that's going to be a central theme or more like Anna, does it, does it unfold as you're writing? I think it's sort of become um, almost a trademark for me, but not something I did intentionally, mm -hmm. very much like Barbara. My my intention when I first started writing, because, you know, I, I love to laugh, believe it or not, when most of my books <laughs> make people rush for the tissue box. Um, I was going to write the next Bridget Jones um, wow. And what do I end up writing? Something like couldn't have been more different. So, and, and everything from there has kind of led me down this path of just diving into emotionally charged situations and also into the psychology of relationships, which fascinates me. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say I certainly um, don't always know what the central theme will be, um, but I generally create emotional dilemmas um, for my characters where my readers will be saying, oh my gosh, not only is what is she going to do, but what would I do if it right. were me? And, and that ability to try to find a way to pull the reader inside their skin yeah. um, and have them just feel it and breathe it and, and put themselves in their situations. I think that's something that kind of drives my writing, um, my, my hope that I can do that. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's certainly not... Um, I mean, I've had many books where I've gone in thinking, okay, this one is going to be different. It's going to be structured. And I'm going to know exactly where I'm going. And I'm, my synopsis is going to be so detailed and it's going to be a blueprint. And and then you get to the writing of it. And as you you also said, Lee, that the characters just take you off on a dance mm -hmm. and you just have to kind of follow. Um, and I love when my characters take me on a tangent um, right. because I always feel like the book ends up richer for it. Oh, absolutely. It, it almost becomes like it's out of your hands. And and I think that, you know, there's I think there's a, a misconception among nonfiction readers that fiction, you know, nonfiction is for people looking for solutions and looking for connections and looking for what would I do if this were me or or what should I do because this is me. But fiction does the same thing as you were just mm -hmm. saying, Alison. I mean, we get you want people to be in your character skin. And like you said, beautifully, not just what is she going to do, but what would I do faced with this? And, and you know, that is that is really the richness of it. I, I totally agree with you. So then how do you separate or do you separate 
let's say it's a it's a very difficult situation um, from your own personal experiences and how would you handle it if it were you? Do you have your characters handle these situations exactly as you would uh, or or are you able to separate the two? And so it, that kind of gets into the whole you know, mixing of personal experiences. So mm -hmm. Anna, let's start with you. What do you have to say about that? Well, um, I would say for, because fiction is so much about getting under the skin of your character and, and exploring something for me that I might not know about, mm -hmm. but I do find um, when I am exploring it, I'm going not to my personal experiences, but to the, my emotions that are similar. So I may not have, as in Angeline's case, she lost her entire family in a tragedy that she blames herself for. I may that I may not have experienced that that tragedy exact, but I have experienced the toll of loss, and I have experienced losing people. And when she goes through a situation where she's bullied, as a middle school teacher, I we witness so much bullying and it was part of my, I feel like life mission that I really want to um, ha have conversations about bullying. So I know, and having been bullied myself, I know that rejection and that feeling. So that's what happens for me when, with fiction. I go into more the emotional truth of it rather than my specific personal experiences on the page. Yeah, that, I think that I think that makes a lot of sense, and and I, I don't know that it's possible not to do that. Um, yeah. You know, and you do sort of become, not that you become one with your characters, but you, you you're inside their feelings um, yeah. as you're writing them, and so I think it, it it's hard not to do that. Um, Allison, how about you? Is it difficult for you to separate your personal experience and responses <laughs> to a situation? Um, or do you, or are you able to, you know, what are your feelings on that? Do you, can you separate the two or do you want to, maybe, maybe you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that probably my experiences do sort of leak in to, um, to my books in many circumstances. Um, but I can separate my experience for the most part as well. Um, I think <sighs> Sometimes I do have to pause and sort of remind myself that this is the character's story, not mine. Mm -hmm. If I'm really deep into something, particularly in the emotionally charged type scenarios, mm -hmm. you pull from and your own experiences and your, your own emotional responses to things. I think that's just human nature. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think when you're digging into that kind of level of authenticity, yeah. um, that then comes through in the writing as well. So I think it en enriches it to a certain extent. Um, I think that that reminder, this is not my story, is also for me a very healthy landmark so that I can allow the characters to have the freedom to make their own mm -hmm. mistakes or choices or reactions and, and, and come back and be authentic in their own voice. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a sort of healthy melding of, of letting that happen and also keeping the lid on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that that authenticity is so important. And Allison, you've written nine novels, which is like my goodness. But you, you almost have to, like you said, you you have to keep reminding yourself, this is her story, not my story. And and I guess I guess when you've written that many books, and I hope to know one day, you don't want your characters sounding the same. Right. So you do have to really keep remind, and unless it's you know a series, or it obviously is the same character. But so yeah. that that remind that that very conscious reminder to yourself that this is her story um, is, is very, uh, yeah. is a very useful thing. Yes. Yeah. Barbara, what did you say? Oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to say something else? No, I was going to say uh, it's interesting when you, it's hard to sometimes not get in your character's way mm -hmm. and you want to, like you see something, you want them to do it. You have an agenda for them and you're worried about them. So you're no, no, don't, you know, and right. I, that's when I, I usually notice that's when my writing does block or shut down when I'm trying to direct the agenda too much. Mm -hmm. And then when I catch myself and I get out of the way, it starts to flow again. But it, that's the hard part for me is to stay out of their way. 
Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I agree because you, 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 it's like you said, you, you, and you're the one writing it and yet you're thinking, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And yet, because you're, you're too much in your own way of yeah. letting that character develop authentically as someone separate from you. Right. Uh, and it, it, it's hard. Authors, I mean, we do, we, we, I think authors, you know, you, you pick apart your life and, and you think you write about things you've experienced or things you know. And so they it creeps in whether the story has anything to do with you or not. Mm -hmm. Whatever, what do you say? Well, I think in many cases, my characters make better choices than I did. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I have found something just recently that is like, just tickles me. It's like, I will write something the way I would react to it. And then I will rewrite it exactly opposite. And that's exactly what I want. Hmm. And, and that turns out to be what I want it to be. So it's kind of funny. It's like I'm pushing myself out of the way. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to be working. I mean, I've written characters that I have no knowledge of how they actually work, like uh, <laughs> pediatric oncologists. You know, I've done a whole lot of research and I can... Not only the research, but the, well, all research, but finding people, survivors of a, mm -hmm. a horrible acts and seeing how they reacted, because I don't, thank goodness, I don't have a lot of that under my belt. I haven't experienced some of the things that I write about, other things I have. And yet still, I find that if I write it with my knee-jerk reaction and then turn around and rewrite it, reacting opposite to that, it works out beautifully. I'm tricking, I think. I'm either tricking myself or my <laughs> characters. One or the other gets tricked, and it seems to work. And, and it flows much better, too. It's like I can write it more easily than than when I write my my reaction. I mean, one of the things that I love about reading and writing, but but to start with reading because that's where we all started. We all started reading books and and just fell in love with it so much that somehow we got hooked on thinking we could write them. Um, <laughs> it is developing empathy and and i mean it's like people i swear and, and i have two ex-husbands i will you know like just point the way to people who don't read i i, I don't know where they get their empathy from right. you know I, I mean i i don't know but that's that's my you know that's my thing i i think that i try to stay out of my character's way um i'm a I'm a big believer in just writing. It's like mm. I I do outline and I do some character. Uh, I don't know descriptions and all before I start writing, but then, but then I just start writing and 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 I sort of adjust the outline as I go because mm. mm. I tend yes. to go off on you know and some of those tangents get ripped out. I mean it's why I'm a slow writer. I think because I'm not more structured in my outlining. And I don't, I think I don't maybe think enough before I start writing. It's like I get, I start working on it and I get so excited. I have to start writing it. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's hard for me to not, Allison, you're shaking your head. Please tell me that you feel some of this because I consider you to be such a pro at, you know, nine books and your books are fabulous. And so, I, I don't know. I, that's just how I feel. It's like, it just Thank sort of goes. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. And I, the feeling is mutual, believe me. Um, for me, I started out with that sense of just give me the page and let me go. And the more I've written and the more books that have, have um, come out. Also, I think it depends very much on your publisher and your editor's mindset and how they work with you as a, as a team. Um, you know, currently, um, the publisher I'm with now, they require a little bit more structure than I was mm previously doing so for me it was like oh hey this is going to be great here's three paragraphs and you know it's a slam dunk by the book you know um and there were ah uh, <laughs> not so bad <laughs> you know, a little bit more about this one <laughs> yeah 
I've now found that I'm actually spending a little bit more time up front than I used to um, structuring, putting a framework around it. And initially I found it really hard because like you, I was just, this story is keeping me up nights. I just want to write, you know, and, yeah. and I now feel like I do have to kind of pull myself back a little bit and put a bit more of a, of a structure around it before I start. Um, having said that, most often it finishes differently than I had intended because in the middle things happen, life happens, characters happen and it does evolve. But but I'm I'm a wee bit more structured than I used to be. Um, I struggled with it to start, but I'm actually finding it's helpful now. Okay. Good to know. Good to yeah. know. Well, and now that we're on that topic, Anna, what what do you what what are your thoughts on that? So do you do you do you have an outline? Do you have a structure or do you just kind of sit down like like you said, do you, your stories come to you in your dreams um, <laughs> do you keep a little do you keep something by your bedside that like if you wake up you want to yeah. jot it down before you yeah yeah i have a, a sketchbook and my regular notebook depending on i think so much in pictures so if i can at least get an image down it gives me something to work with in the morning but i would say structure wise um i just i only have two books so i don't i haven't really fallen in into any particular pattern but i get the sense that i'm not very structured um I, because i so love just write the writing of it i i will say though after i write straight through the first draft and i usually do that longhand and i just write and write and write and write and then that there are several drafts after that then the structure starts to fall together so it's like having pieces you know, I have a huge table and I could cut out all the scenes and then I start moving the scenes around and seeing, you know, where they best fit, what makes the most sense, what will, you know, what, what intrigues me, what if I did this, mm -hmm. you know, so every, every draft gets a little, has a little more structure to it. And the first one's really just the scaffolding and gets mm -hmm. me set up for themes and ideas. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I could ever, I would be shocked, but I'm not going to say never, but I don't think I could write to an outline in the beginning. I don't think I could know. I don't know. I, I just don't, I don't know if I could do that, but we'll see. It's yeah. interesting. I just uh, was doing some writing exercises. I was a little bit stuck with my writing and um, I did these two exercises and Barbara, one is kind of similar to what you were saying, where you write a scene that you have in your head. And then it's, it's called, I think it's called like a kitchen timer exercise. Then you take that same scene and you write it completely different. Mm -hmm. and it's such a challenge, but the, the idea is that many authors will then choose the, the scene that was completely different from what they thought. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is this thing called an inside outline where you just make yourself do an outline, even though it's probably going to change. The idea being that every scene you're including goes toward your central point, which it's easy. I think that's good for if you tend to go off the rails and, you know, to kind of reel it back in. in your central point. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's just I think everybody just has to sort of do some variation of that. It's mm -hmm. interesting because I, I get I have the privilege of talking to so many authors uh, because of the roadshow and everyone's different. Some people very stringently work from an outline and others say, oh my gosh, I could never do that. I would find that that would hold me back. I, I prefer to just, you know, sit down and do it, even though it means going back and more editing, you know, everybody finds their own style. So it's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. So how do you, how do you feel about writing uh, a character that your readers might be very frustrated with, frustrated with her choices, um, or, you know, kind of that character that, that your, your reader might just want to shake and say, what are you doing? Um, so Allison, how do you, I think we, you had, uh, we talked about this a little bit. So do you, are you, is that difficult to do? Do you worry about that from the, the reader standpoint or how do you feel about that? Yeah, in a word, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's been a challenge for me in the past. It always has. And I, you know, my couple of my very early books were, um, my main critiques were, look, the character is just too perfect. This person would not, this isn't real, you know, you have to have, uh, you know, there has to be the downside, the dark side, the bad choice. Um, and so I had to really work on that in the editing process. And um, I worry that if the character is too fallible, um, which, you know, we all make questionable choices, let's face it, you know, we, we all look back in life and go, what was I thinking? Um, some, I, some of us more than others. <laughs> well, 
but I was afraid that if we, you know, if I went too far down that road, then the reader might not forgive them those those mistakes ah. or those choices or those, and that would turn the reader to the point where they're like, oh, "Do I really care what happens to this person now? Because she's just driving me nuts." Right. Um, so it's finding the line for me between, right. you know, sort of forgivable mistakes and sort of anything that's too heinous. <laughs> um is is difficult territory and um i always want my readers to feel like the characters are really relatable and that they can put themselves in their shoes and feel their feels and um and as i say consider what they would do in their situation so um i don't tend to um write characters that are extreme in some respects in that way um but which is kind of paradoxical because some of my favorite literary characters are so far from perfect. I mean, people that I love to read, like, I mean, look at Ele Eleanor Oliphant, for instance. She's oh. kind of like wonderfully awful. Oh my gosh, that was such I a great book. Couldn't get enough of her, you know? Yeah. So there's that, I have to remind myself of that when I feel um, that kind of fear taking over. I'm like, come on, you know, just just take a bite, <laughs> it's okay. Um, readers and don't underestimate readers also um, because I believe that um, that that does happen sometimes um, don't underestimate them people have the intelligence and the integrity and the empathy to read and understand why this character did what she did and where she's coming from um, so as I'm I'm learning with every single book with every single draft I write I learn and learn and learn mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm learning that that's you know shouldn't be as scary territory as it once was for me. Mm -hmm. that, that is so great. In fact, I wrote it down and we are, uh, the people watching are saying they love it too. It, it's that, that slippery slope of you don't want her to be too perfect, but then you also don't want her to do things that are unforgivable. Because yeah. either way, you, you don't want your characters to lose to lose that empathy and to want to not care what happens to her. So that's, that's such a great point. Right. Anna, you, so you, I'm thinking of Angeline, um, like <laughs> she's so fabulous um, and, and talking about following your, your heart or following the rules, uh, Angeline ends up going, she's in, she's in a traditional convent. When that runs out of money, she ends up going to uh, one where it, they're anything but traditional, uh, yeah. very progressive. Um, they do not, they're not, they do not behave as you would think traditional nuns do. Um, so what, what about, what's that, what's that thought process like for you? Where are you afraid or, or do, do you concern yourself with whether people will, um, you know, want to strangle your characters, <laughs> or do you just kind of write it and think, you know what, whatever, whatever it is, this, this is what it is. Yeah. Um, well, I, I do try to stay with the character and, and serve the character in the story you know, farther along in the drafting process, I start to think about, you know, is this, uh, did I really get to her essence? Does she feel real? Does mm. she, am I getting, and have I really developed her in a complex way or have I kept her this way, you know, just a certain, not, not enough dynamic in her. And because I find if you, if the characters are developed well enough, they see, feel real, they, they seem more real then because we're all flawed. You know, we all have imperfections and questions and concerns, and um, and that's why I, I I do tend to fall into darker stories because I feel like that's the other side of the happy coin, mm -hmm. you know, and that's part of life. And I feel mm -hmm. I feel like we need all the stories. Yeah. We need the happy, the light, the dark, the okay. sad, the messy, the wild, yeah. just like we need all of us. So right. I'm happy to you know raise my hand for that <laughs> the dark character, but yeah. you know. Angeline in the beginning, um, because she's so, uh, she has so much self-loathing and I worried, I, I did, I worried about her and how she was handling that. So I thought she was, it was interesting. She, she made, she was feeling in this extreme way, this extreme loss and guilt. And so she chose to go into this cloister, not for the wrong reasons, really. Mm -hmm. And she, she thought that would be her atonement. She could, you know, pray for the suffering of others because she'd caused so much suffering mm -hmm. and that being in the cloister where it's, it was silent all day and there were minute to minute reminders of the rules. And so the rules were very clear and she didn't because she no longer trusted herself. The rules were very helpful to have 
And, mm-hmm. and because I think that's what happens in our identity when we don't mm-hmm. feel like we're the driving force of our lives anymore. We let other people make the rules for us. Mm-hmm. And that's what she was doing. And so when it, it was such an extreme then to go to this very radical con- convent where you have these women who've decided to leave the constructs and the rules of the church and create their own inclusive community. And now suddenly it feels there are no rules. And that was a, a dilemma for her. And, and it was really, uh, I can say as, as a reader, that was like, oh my gosh, how is she going to last a day here? Mm-hmm. But it was so, it was so fascinating to me to have to, to see her thrown into that. And that's what really, you know, cause we want, I think we want to see our characters evolve because mm-hmm. if they're in, they're in conflict and they're in crisis. And so, putting them in a situation as you did, as all of you did in your books, uh, where they really are just kind of, you know, spun around and okay, now what is, is really, that's where that evolution comes from. And I think that's where readers, readers will, you know, empathize and, and, you know, some of them like Angeline really is just kind of like, ah, oh, what's she going to do? So it's, it's a, it was so fascinating when, you know, to see her put in that situation, like you said, she was just somewhat filled with so much self-loathing and really just relied on the rules um, because she thought that's what she deserved. Um, Barbara, how about you? Uh, So what, what do you, what do you have to say about this? Do you, do you think about, all right, do my, do, are my readers going to hate this character? Are they going to let, do you think about that or do you, you know, do you just. Well, I didn't when I wrote nowhere near goodbye, it never entered my mind that Emma, who was the pediatric oncologist, that Mm -hmm. she would come across as so unlikable because she would appear to be willingly let her daughter go with her husband so that she could concentrate on her research. Mm -hmm. But all along the way, I thought, that I was showing pieces of how much she loved her daughter, but apparently not. And what happened with that book is, surprisingly to me, some readers absolutely hated her, but I cannot tell you how many doctors and nurses wrote to me and said, this is the way researchers are. Mm-hmm. You got her down. Exactly. And I had no idea. It just seemed to me that if you're going to, because I'm a very black and white person. So it seemed to me if I was going to devote myself to something as important as curing a brain tumor, I would have to devote myself 24 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I created Emma. And I was really shocked. I mean, some people loved the book and hated Emma. Yes, I can see that. And, and some people loved the book and loved Emma. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't really give me a, 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 a good idea of what's the best way to write the character. So in the second book, my main character is Miss Maggie, who I personally loved, and most people also did. Um, a few people, even though I, I set it in a setting where um, gay people and um, lesbians and, and gay men, and I, in, in a time period where it was not at all accepted, trying to make it understandable that this is how this woman reacted when she discovered that she loved the woman. Right. And most people got that, got that. It was like in that time period, that's what it was like. And I mean, some people even commented, I bet there was a lot of aunts and uncles and whatever that we did not know about. Mm -hmm. You know, we did not know why they made these choices. And and the next thing you know, they have a roommate, whatever, because people didn't broadcast their love. Mm -hmm. So I thought that would help. And it did for the most part. But now with my third book, I wanted to write, surprise, surprise, about a man. My main character, well, there's two main characters. It's a husband and wife. 
but the man is really the main, main character. Mm. And I wanted to write about a man who was a bad man, made bad choices, and then turned into a good man. And I wrote it that way. And then I discovered that in order for readers to love him and then hate him and then love him, yeah. I had to make him good to begin with. Right. Which involved a complete rewrite. <clears throat> so we'll see whether that works. I don't know. It's like I am, and I'm sure you all are too, amazed at how involved mm -hmm. our readers get in our characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done book clubs where the readers talk about these people like they're sitting across the table. Mm -hmm. from them. Mm -hmm. And I so want to say, you do know they're not real, right? <laughs> but of course I don't, but because I'm just like amazed how, yeah. but, but I do that myself. In fact, I actually contacted Jody Picot because I was not happy with a book that's how it ended. And what was the book? My Sister's Keeper. <laughs> yeah, no, it was one of her more recent. Yes, that, that one definitely. But it was one of her more recent ones. It was the one about the the um, it was the one about Egypt and and all of the, oh, the yes something um, of thirds whatever. Yeah. And the way it yeah. ended, it was it was um, you, with everything else. There was also a love story, mm -hmm. and it was like the most emotional love story I've seen her write in mm -hmm. my opinion. But it ended in a way that most of us would get our hands slapped if mm -hmm. we did. It was mm -hmm. like we didn't know what choice she was going to make. And I literally wrote to her oh, and I said, I did not like the way you ended this book. Oh, I did. I seriously did. And not that long ago, like a year ago. <laughs> and I said, I did not like the way this ended. And I told her why, you know, I told her because this is like a personal story to me. Uh, um, a woman has to choose between leaving her husband and her daughter and, and, and going to the man she loves. Okay. It's a very personal story. And she left it like, well, what choice did she, you know, what was her decision? Right. So she responded to me. I mean, my letter was very respectful <clears throat> and she responded to me and she said, so if it was you, would you leave the man who, you know, was like the love of your life from the time you were or, 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 or what, would, what would, and so that was my answer. I knew then that her intent was she was going with the lover rather than stay with the, the dependable husband. <clears throat> That is how I interpreted that. She could have meant something totally different, but she mm -hmm. answered, you know. It was like that is amazing. amazing. I know, yeah. right? That's but amazing. I, and it was like, she can be approachable and she can also not be approachable. So I mm -hmm. think it kind of depends maybe, I don't know, on her mood, on the book, on the question. I mean, I was very respectful, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I'm but, sure you were. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think just, that's, that's that happens so often with readers. They just are so sometimes you're just so yes. infuriated that you mm -hmm. and especially when you're not really sure exactly How it what the intent is at the end. I and always then, oh sorry. No. I you always appreciate how Jody ends her books. I think they tend to be a little arbitrary. And it I for me I love an ending that just leaves me kind of challenged. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes me think a little bit. I do. I don't. Don't. De definitely don't need the happy ending. I want it to make some sense. And I, when I think about some of her endings, I was just we were talking about my sister's keeper, and I didn't. And I won't spoil it if people haven't read it. But I, I was very sad at how that ended. And then the more I thought about it, I thought because I was putting a certain theme on her book, and and when she was probably just she may have been writing about the fragility and randomness of life. And then her ending is perfect. You yeah. know, that's what I'd like to think about. I think Great Gatsby was right. Grapes of Wrath, Hamlet, right. <laughs> that we don't, Romeo and Juliet, we don't have to have, I think for me, I, I want to have endings that that make sense and maybe shift the theme a little bit about, you know, maybe we, we thought it was a character that wanted power, but instead they got the knowledge that they deserve to be loved. 
or they deserve to be forgiven. So it makes us think about it. So it's fascinating, you know, and, and that's where readers think, are so interesting to hear from. Yeah, know? and I think it's also fascinating, I think uh, just bringing up, you know, things like, I know we're getting a little off the rails here, but you mentioned the great gas. <laughs> You know, you read that in high school and you're like, oh, these glamorous, what you, pe-? and then you read it when you're older and you're like, these are terrible, awful. Yeah, people. they're yeah. awful. They're yeah. awful. Your perspective changes because you live life and you ha- you have experiences. And then you, as we were saying, you're, you, there's more of that, well, what would I do? Yeah. Because exactly. you have more life experience. So, what about the happy ending? Do we, uh, so Anna brings up a great point. Um, and, and I think we've all gotten feedback uh, from readers about this. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you think about? And, and our, we have some great comments here. We have Allison uh, Janine. Janine is thanking you uh, for talking about the balancing act between perfect and fallible characters, which is, you know, crazy. And uh, uh, Michelle is saying empathy plays a huge part. I think at so many of our women's fiction readers mm-hmm. uh, do. Yeah, like like Barbara said, how do you have empathy if you don't read? Um, but so let's talk about the happy ending. Do you think, all right, I got to make this ending something. And I think Anna, you just touched on this. The answer is no for you. Uh, are you, you know, you don't, what do you think about, and cause sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Allison, what do you think? What do you, do you, do you think about whether in writing the story, do you have that in mind, whether you want it to be a happy ending or not, or does that sort of unfold as you go? Um, again, I never, I won't say never, I rarely have an ending in mind oh, okay. um, that I'm absolutely married to. Okay. Um, I don't think that an archetypal happy ending always is necessary or mm. does the story any favors. Right. Um, however, I suppose it really does also depend on how you define a happy ending. Yeah, it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, for instance, in a situation, you know, a character decides that, you know, her marriage is over for, for better, for worse. She's done everything she can. She knows in her heart of hearts that she and her husband are going to be far better off on their own paths, doing different things. Um, and that's the, ch- the path they choose for me. That's a happy ending. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Like Anna said, it makes sense if you look at it, depending on what you what you yeah. believe those characters ultimately were looking for. Yes. And, you know, one, it might not be considered the happy ending, but it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. and I think the term that, that Anna used is perfect. It's arbitrary because it yeah. really is in relative terms to what you're describing to someone who's in any particular time in their life, at a particular moment in their life, it can have a completely different meaning to them. Um, and it's what it means to us as individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that one of my, um, my better... Um, performing books had an ending that I had to really go to bat for with my editor on um, she was saying oh, I just don't know about this I just don't know about this and I think we need to you know it needs to be kind of tied up a little bit sweeter and I just said you know what no I just feel this is this is the real end to this story and mm-hmm. She's like, mm, okay, <laughs> we'll go with it, you know. And honestly, I had more feedback from people and readers and responses to that ending than I had to most of my other books. That they Good. just, it wasn't what we wanted, but it was perfect for the book. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so right. It doesn't. Have, ne- it's not to. necessarily. Readers aren't aren't necessarily looking for everything to be tied up in a nice, neat little bow because life isn't like that. Yeah. And like you said, it, it, what, what, who are we to define another person's happiness? So exactly. in that sense, then really what is a happy ending? Barbara, what do, I know you, you're not, you don't, you're not married to the happy ending. No, no, <laughs> I, I've never tied up a book in a pink little bow yet. Yeah. Um, the funny thing though, again, because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, <laughs> I was, it's true. It's totally it true. Do, Barbara. I, I know, right? I wrote nowhere near goodbye. It was published, and then after it's published, I decide to write a prequel. Okay, so I am totally locked into how the story ends. And I'm like, like 40 years beforehand, right? And so when people got to the end of My Secret to Keep, and discovered, and spoiler here, that Miss Maggie didn't tell Amanda that she was her mother. People were up in arms. And I said, did you read Nowhere Near Goodbye? <laughs> she never told her. I couldn't change the ending when a book no. is already published. So the <laughs> story is 
<laughs> if you're going to write a prequel, don't publish the first book for yet. You know, it's like I had no idea, and nor did anybody tell me. It's like nobody said. My publisher did not say, "Oh, this is not a good idea." My publisher said, "Oh yeah, I love this book." <laughs> Because they both could be standalones. Right. You could read one and not read the other. You could read My Secret to Keep and not need to read Nowhere Near the Bod. Right. But the people who read both or the people who only read My Secret to Keep were up in arms in the way I ended it. And just getting back to Jody Picot for a minute, <laughs> I don't like Happy Ever After books. That was a really personal thing to me. That mm -hmm. was the thing. Like, I made that choice. I wanted that author to make, I wanted that character to make the same choice because right. otherwise I made the wrong choice. That's exactly right. how I yeah. felt. That's, that's how involved that I was in yeah. that particular story. And that's what drew me. And I didn't say this to Jodi Picot, but she must have intuited something because First of all, she took the time to respond, but it was like, I was desperate to know what yeah. choice that woman made, because that would mean I, in my little pinhead, would mean that I either made the right choice or the wrong choice. Mm. It, it's like, you know, I think you have to be a certain kind of wacko to write books. And, and, and Allison and Anna, I, I don't put you in those categories. It's, it's just me. And Lee. Well, what, I don't, what, I don't you can mention me. I'm, a, I'm the only one, right, who, who has to be wacko to write a book. No, I'm happy to be in that category with you, Barbara. Okay, thank you. I'll hang there with you. All okay. right. Good yeah, job. I think, I think you're right. I think there's definitely something wrong with all of us. But So um, <laughs> I can't believe we're almost running out of time, but I wanted to ask this one more thing. Uh, before we get to, I want you all of you to be able to tell uh, people where we can find you and where we can find your fabulous work. But uh, I, I love this question. How much of a role do you think identity plays on the decision for people to follow the rules or follow their heart? So their culture, their history, you know, their past, their, their environment. Um, so how much do you, how, you know, if you have these characters and they grow up in certain times of types of families in certain types of cultures and you know their history is one way so how much how much of a uh, how much do you think that plays a role in a character's decision Anna what do you think about whether to follow her heart or follow the rules I think that um, the role of identity is is huge and how we decide whether we're going to follow the rules or follow our heart. I think I think it's huge, and it, I, probably because I spent the years writing Angeline, thinking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, not just um, how identity. When I looked at Angeline, and because she came from a, a more traumatic, she had her identity wasn't very well shaped. Right. She was young; her parents weren't really available to her, so a lot of her identity was based on the witnesses around her. And so, when she lost the witnesses, she didn't really have an identity. And so, I was very interested in that. How did that help her? That that really influenced her decision making, mm -hmm. and it influenced her decision to go into this place with all its rules. So then, I became very interested in. So, if you come from a background of lots of support and and love and education and conditioning that allows you to speak out in your mm -hmm. home will you how will you approach your life then and how does that how does that impact your courage to break rules or not or mm -hmm. or just your just decision to follow the rules because sometimes we need to do that yeah. you know so i think i think it's it's huge that courage and fear kind of exist together you know if there was there wasn't the fear we wouldn't need the courage and we yeah. need the identity to face the fear exactly yeah that's that's that that is well said and and when you when you get to angeline's you know when you read then get a little bit more into her childhood and what had happened it, it makes you know her choices then again they become they make a lot of sense for what she, she thought she deserved allison what do you think about the role of identity I apologize. My, one of my dogs has decided to toss a ball around the room for a second. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I um, I agree. I think that um, that just intrinsically becomes part of how you function as a person, um, whether it's cultural or or any other kind of influence like that. Um, 
certainly having lived in, in different cultures around the world, it, it would form how I would write about that person, depending on where they'd come from. Um, so I do, I just think it's it's definitely part of the makeup. Um, I know for, for my own situation, it's definitely influenced how I make decisions and choices and, and it's, you can only base it on um, on you know the experiences that you've had um, and the makeup that that, that makes you as, as a person. Um, and, and I'm thinking of your main character in the Child Between Us, and she, you know, where she was sort of <laughs> hello there, uh, you know, she was kind of the caretaker for her mother. She sort of was, you know, trying to keep things, you know, even keeled with all the things that had happened, and then with her sister. And so it does it shapes. You think, well, I have a role here, and I've got to exactly. play the course. And then of course she's thinking of the painful you know, thing that had happened to her before. But so, yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. It, it, all of those things shape the decision whether to follow, follow the rules or not. Barbara, I think I know what you're going to say, but hit me. <laughs> Identity. Um, I think, well, I'm going to go with environment. Um, I think the environment you are raised in mm -hmm. has a lot to do with whether you will, um, follow the rules or your heart mm -hmm. um and i personally was raised in an extremely strict environment and um both of my in both books my main characters were also raised in very strict environments and when they broke the rules, they really broke the rules. Yes. Yes. And that's exactly what I can say about myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But isn't you know, that so I, true that sometimes you you know these people who were raised with so such strict and then they go off to college and they, they go completely crazy. crazy. Because it's and, and I know with my I have two older grandchildren who I just cannot say enough about, but their parents, my daughter and her husband, initially were, again, pretty strict about certain things. Lenient about some things, but really strict about you will do this and you will do that, right? Well, they basically were a lot different than me. And they said, you know, bull. And um, so finally, my daughter and her husband saw that it wasn't working right and they let them make their own decisions in things that they should be able to make their own decisions mm -hmm. and those two 25 and 23 i mean i'm not going to say they're perfect but they're pretty close to perfect. They're pretty close exactly. i think, I think it, it's an example of if you don't have the chance to grow and make mistakes exactly as a young person you could be in a whole lot of trouble as an older person. So I think environment has a whole lot to do with whether you are going to continue following the rules mm -hmm. or not. But then I have a, a, my, a younger granddaughter who just turned 16. That child <laughs> does exactly what her mother says. It just kills me. <laughs> Because her mother did not do that. Her mother did not do that. That child right. does exactly what her mother says. And she's 16. And she seems perfectly happy. And so that's good. That's good. You know, so you're, it, you're, it's like. We're you're waiting for her to act like her mother did when she was 16. And oh, she please God. Just, just for like one day. Right. Just for one day. Let her act like her mother did. But no, so she's just like. But I see there is so much love between them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, whether that changes or not, I don't know. But don't you find people, and and I think this is another reason why we write, people are so fascinating. The yeah. way they react to different scenarios. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like you can't necessarily always ever assume, right. figure out. what, And mm -hmm. it makes us so fascinating i think that's what i love the whole psychology of relationships what yes, yes. is i just find that there's there's so much material in just yes. that that you could 
bright, but exactly. forever, as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. Yeah. And, and when I was in college, I wanted to major in psychology. And of course, at that time, you would be a teacher. That was what you were going to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I graduated, but did I ever teach? No, because I got married and, you know, whatever. But um, I, I, I don't know. I, I just think, I just think you follow the rules until you just can't anymore. I, 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 I totally agree. I, I, I mean, I know that's what I did. And I think, Allison, you said it earlier. That's what makes us all, or, or, and I think we all, actually all of you touched on it. Mm -hmm. We need all of those things in our books because that's what, that's, we are all of those things. No yeah. person does the same thing in every situation. We come from different environments. We come from different histories and backgrounds and so yeah. forth. And yeah. I am, we could talk for another hour. This has been so great. I want to though, make sure that we have time for you all to uh, tell everyone out there where we can find you, where we can find your work, what you're working on next. So Allison, why don't we start with you? Um, great. <laughs> First of all, thanks so much for having me. It's been so good to talk to you ladies. <laughs> but, um, my books are available, as as they say, everywhere, um, online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, currently um, working on my next novel, which will be out in the spring of next year. Okay. Um, so I'm excited about that one. My last book, um, The Child Between Us, is um, coming up in August, actually. Um, on going to be on a Kindle monthly deal in Canada, Canada, Australia, and the US. Um, awesome. All of August. So I'm very excited about that. Nice. Um, if, uh, if people haven't read it yet, then it's a good time to grab it. It's in the month of August. <laughs> great. I highly recommend. It's a great book. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. Anna, where can we find you? What are you working on? Um, you, well, you could find both The Night Child and Angeline anywhere you like to get books. And I think, and I'm hoping that most of the libraries are, are now carrying um, both of them. And uh, I like to support bookshop.org because they support independent bookstores as much as possible, or just your local independent bookstore is a wonderful way to keep those alive. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I'm working on my next one. I'm just finishing the book tour for Angeline. Actually, this is my last real event for a little bit after Aww. since February. And so now I can start writing again. And um, this time I'm working, going to work on a historical fiction book. So oh, this is so not great. this is coming through research. So okay, great. Oh, we look forward to that. Awesome. Yes, absolutely. Barbara, where can we find you? Okay, well, my website is my best place to find me, which is barbaraconryauthor.com. Um my books are available anywhere online, whether it's Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. Um, some, a few bookstores do carry my books. Um, a lot more libraries carry my books than bookstores do, which is mm -hmm. I think wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, as I've talked about during, my third character moves her hands a lot because she's Italian. My third <laughs> character. So, where did that come from? I, I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, I, I know. But anyway, as I said, I'm working on a book that um, right now the working title is A, a Good Man. But because oh, okay. where is a good man, you know. But um, I'm really intrigued with this story of um, a husband and wife. And the wife wants to become a surrogate. And the husband thinks that's okay <laughs> and is all for it until he decides it isn't. Mm. And then he turns from beloved husband and father to someone he doesn't even recognize. Mm. So um, I always seem to have some medical thing mm. in my books. It's always something. And I find I have a neighbor who actually has been a surrogate three times. And that's what actually prompted yeah. me to start doing research on surrogacy. Okay. So um, that's where I'm at. It's due to my agent, like last week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, have to, we'll keep up with you. Well, I'll keep up with you, but everybody can keep up with you on your website and your socials. So ladies, yeah. after we sign off, stay with me for just a minute uh, after we sign off. But I just want to thank all of you so much. This has been such a wonderful conversation. You're all such wonderful talented authors and it's been my privilege to be able to Aww. chat with you uh this afternoon well thank you for wonderful so much yeah
Yeah, I loved Thank it. You. So much fun. Okay, everybody, we'll see you next month. Ladies, stay with me for a minute. I'm going to end this broadcast. And thank you for joining us today.